Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. We've mentioned NASA on the show many times before, and I have even had email contact with Robert Manning, an engineer who is ostensibly the chief engineer on the Mars Curiosity program. He agreed to answer technical questions about the mission, but then ran away from my questions when it seemed he could not answer them, affirming the phrase that NASA stands for, never a straight answer. If you don't believe what I have just said, then please watch this lecture from the link on the screen, which includes evidence that Curiosity may not be situated on Mars and could be in the Canadian Arctic. I am joined today by somebody who has also had communication with NASA, albeit in a slightly more surreptitious method. I'd like to welcome onto Rich Planet, Gary McKinnon. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me on. All right, then, um, I think a large number of uh, my viewers will know who you are already and, and have the outline uh, of your story, um, which we will go through the, the basic points of today. Yep. Um, and it started with an interest in, in UFOs. Uh, can you tell us first, uh, when did your interest in UFOs start? Um, UFOs specifically, well, I was always into stars. Apparently, even when I was three years old, I was always asking about the stars and stuff. So. I was always looking at the sky from a young age. Your interest in UFOs goes back a long way, and I've not heard this on mainstream TV before, right, right back to the age of when you were 12. Yep. So tell us about that. Um, my stepfather, because my parents split up when I was six and we moved down from Glasgow to London. Uh, my stepfather was an avid science fiction fan, um, so I suppose that's what really got me into all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, science fiction, you get interested in aliens and UFOs and the possibility of life in outer space and contact with other beings is probably one of the most exciting things we can imagine, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I then joined Bufora, the British UFO Research Association, when I was about 12. It was a, it was a subscription-based thing and you got a, a monthly newsletter, if I remember rightly. It was a long time ago now. Right, um, right. Mm. All right, so how did you find out about the Disclosure Project? Well, obviously, having an interest in UFOs, when the internet came to Britain in the mid-90s, mm. Uh, an incredible resource for UFO information. And um, so after a while, you do stumble across the... Well, actually, I was already interested in just finding out stuff. But then, was it 2000 or 2001? 2001 was the conference. The, the that's, that's what really got me going, that conference. Right. To me, that was mind-blowing, all these high-level witnesses. You know. Right, because it, it wasn't widely publicised. No. So how, how did you know about it when it, when it came about? Um, I think someone else told me, um, and they told me before it was actually, before the event took place. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I think I'm right in remembering at the time, they had uh, some kind of broadcast failure as well. Right. Um, so it didn't reach the sort of multicast internet audience that they hoped it would at the time. Okay. Yeah. So that was your inspiration to try and find out more, the, the Disclosure mm -hmm. Project, or one of the pieces of inspiration. So. I gather it was after the Disclosure Project conference that you got sort of caught red-handed with your computer-related activities. Yeah. Um, w were you involved in computer-related activities uh, before the Disclosure Project, or was it, or was that the? Uh, that that was that was the instigator to right having a look. Right. <laughs> if I can call it that. All right. So, so yeah. can you just tell us how you went about trying to find out information that you thought was being kept secret? Yep. Um, part of the, one of the Disclosure Project witnesses is uh, Donna Hare, and um, she was working at Johnson Space Center at NASA. Uh, she had secret clearance. She was a, a photographic sort of mission launch specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, she said that one day when she was working in Building 8, so she actually mentioned the building of uh, Johnson Space Center, JSC, um, there was a colleague who was in another room, but they all, they all had secret clearance, but they were on different projects. Mm -hmm. And um, she was in this chap's lab or room, whatever it is, and he said to her, come and take a look at this. You know, what do you think this might be? And um, he showed her a picture of uh, a large white disk, uh, presumably a satellite photograph, uh, above the Earth, but not very high above the Earth because there was um, a shadow on the trees, which Donna Hare didn't spot at first. And being a, a photographic expert, she said, well, is that a blob in the emulsion? That's her first professional thought. And the guy said, blobs in the emulsion don't cast circular shadows. And uh, she basically said that he told her his entire lab was to do with airbrushing out UFOs from high res satellite imagery from NASA because they're so preponderant mm -hmm. around the planet. 
Right, and did she give the name of the building that she was working in? Building 8. Building 8. Mm. So, <coughs> um, just tell us then technically how you went about trying to access in information like that. Yeah. Um, well, I was already on Johnson Space Center, you know, in terms of my illegal presence there, uh, because they ran Windows. Um, they were running something called NetBIOS over the internet. NetBIOS is a, an office protocol, basically, for Windows. It's very insecure. There's no way you should be running that open to the internet. So it was very easy to get in. And um, So I'll just interrupt you there, Gary. So you, you would need the IP address that's running the NetBIOS initially to try and uh, request data from it, yeah? Yeah. So, you, so, so, so how did you find the IP address of Building 8 or, or whatever system you were, you were okay. trying to access? Yeah. Well, you can, um, you can. That's publicly available, is it? Oh yeah, there's, there's online services where you can you can type in, you know, Johnson Space Center, or the network name, which I think was JSC-NASA.gov, and uh, they give you the whole IP block that they own. Right. And somewhat stupidly, uh, NASA, just like the military and everyone else, wasn't using non-routable uh, internet addresses, like which are safe for offices because they're they're private. You know, mm. what I mean. So this is what you call an internet-facing IP address yeah. on a desktop computer? Um, is that yeah, the desktop computers, the main servers. So there was obviously. no firewall at all? It's as if, so you could ping the computers yep. in NASA on a desk from your own router? Yeah, some of them wouldn't ping, but I'd still probe them just in case they didn't reply to pings, but they were still live machines. Right. So you, you, you gained access to a whole raft of, of computer systems within... Well... W w w can I ask you, was it just NASA? Oh no, they're all like this. Um, that, that was I used that one single method mm -hmm. to gain entry to the places I got into. Right, and are you allowed to say which other places you got into? Or well, I'll say it was it was the army, the navy, and NASA, and the Pentagon. Right, the right. And are they were they all on separate banks of IP addresses? Each of those that you've just mentioned. Oh yeah, yeah, completely separate blocks. Right. Yeah. So you knew you, whether you were whether you were trying to access NASA or Pentagon or Army, Navy. They're all in completely different IP ranges. Yeah, yeah. But right. once you're in there, it can better get a bit confusing because once you start exploring, there's attached networks, other networks, private networks, and in the end, you're not really sure where you are after a while. But right. Uh, all right. So it was. It was quite comprehensive, this sort of amount of access that you had. And I've heard you say that there were other people there who also do oh. what you were doing. And, and would you say that you were one of the more, more prolific pers people doing that? Did you get an impression or, or would you not be able to say? I can't say because I don't know what they were doing, but um, I did a simple command because when, when you're on there, at first I was using the command line interface, so it's just a black box. And, uh, but you do a command on Windows called netstat, and you can see all the other connections to the same machine. And then you can look up for those IP addresses and think, well, God, they're from China, they're from Denmark, they're from Turkey. It's like the whole world was in these machines. And I knew that was wrong, because there's no way people from all over the world should be on NASA machines. Mm -hmm. So they must have all been unwelcome guests like I was. Right, so what period of time from when you first accessed the first uh, system to when you got arrested, what sort of, what's the duration we're talking? Oh, like 18 months, two years. Right, mm -hmm. all right. So you, you, did you have any feeling at the time that you might get collared for this at all? No, because I thought, initially, I mean, the security's so lax anyway. Um, I thought, well, if, if it's that easy to get in, then they probably aren't monitoring properly. Right, so. right. all right. So let, let's um, talk about what you saw before we go on to then what happened with the arrest and everything. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how long was it before you saw anything of any sort of significance? Oh, a long time. Right. Um, you know, months and months. Uh, so did you not get bored with it, or was it always keeping your fascination with what, what kept you going back if you didn't get anything for, for months and months? Oh, the promise of possibly finding something. Right. And, the, and the fact it was so easy, and I thought at some point this is going to close the store and they'll stop running NetBIOS over the internet. Right. And you won't be able to find blank passwords so easily. Right. And every time you, you were in uh, communicating with a particular I online IP address, did, would you always know which building you were accessing computers from? No, not at all. Not, not the physical building. Right. No, no. Right. All right, so just tell us um, when you got your first hit, if you like, as, as regards actually seeing something interesting. The first thing was, was documentation. Um, I used a program called Land Search, a thing that once you had control over the domain, um, because you'd get control of domain controllers, so you own the whole network, basically. 
and uh, land search could actually search all the files and folders on every machine. And obviously it's hard because things aren't going to be called secret UFO data dot PDF, are they? Mm. So, um, but I'd scan and look for documents, et cetera, et cetera. And I found an Excel spreadsheet that was actually called, or at least in, in the heading of the column, it said non-terrestrial officers. That's like, my bloody God, that's just Non-terrestrial officers. Non-terrestrial officers with um, ranks and names. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a separate sheet uh, with tabs for material transfer between ships. And these were, I mean, I don't remember the names now. That's you know, a long time ago. A lot of people give me a hard time for not remembering the names and stuff, but it was a long time ago. Right. But uh, non-terrestrial officers thought, well, it must be, let's try and cut out all the possible um, conventional explanations first. I searched for that term. It was nowhere. It was right. nowhere at all. Now, if you search for the term, you only find links to me and right. stuff that I've said. Right. right, I see, I see. So it wasn't a standard thing in the military at all. Right. Um, so I took that to be, they must have a space-based, a secret space-based... So the non-terrestrial officers, what, it couldn't be astronauts? It could be. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's up to you how you interpret that, isn't it? Right. But these ships were called USS whatever and USS whatever. So they started with USS. Yeah, so that, that implies Navy. And I think the Navy, the Navy do a lot of space stuff, right. the US Navy. And, and so how many officers' names would, would you estimate were listed and how many ships mm. were listed? Probably, oh, God. I think there was probably one screen full of officers' names. So what's that, 25 rows? Right. On Excel okay. spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And these were ro low resolution days as well. So you're talking yeah. about 800 by 600 screens, so not very big. Uh, but the ships was probably, I don't know, a third of the spreadsheet. So estimate how many different ship names you saw? Oh, God, maybe eight, ten. Eight or ten. Yeah. And d am I right in thinking that you then tried to search for those specific names? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. And didn't find a thing. Right, yeah. so you think that they could be classified. Not, not the names of the people, the names of the ships. Yeah, yeah. but they could be classified uh, secret or top secret names of s some sort of craft or ship. Yeah, obviously not public. Right. So. All right, and Gary, well, we'll continue this uh, after the break.